some housekeeping. So that meeting, this meeting is now being recorded as you heard, so uh, I'll crack on. So um, some housekeeping to start with. Um, so welcome to this uh, panel presentation and question and answer. Uh, so my name's Chris North. I'm based at Cardiff University, uh, where I'm head of public engagement, and so I'm delighted to be able to, to chair this today. Um, you will notice, as I just said, you will notice that your video and microphone are off and you probably don't have the ability to uh, turn them on. That's just because of the settings we've set. So do not adjust your set. Uh, that is um, planned. Um, if uh, We will invite you to turn them on if you've got a question to ask. Um, uh, so if you have a question to ask later, uh, after we've done the panel presentations, uh, which should last about 20 minutes, uh, then uh, you can raise your hand and uh, Grace, who's uh, assisting us, will uh, be able to uh, unmute you and invite you to activate your video uh, if you want to ask uh, via video. Uh, uh, failing that, you can ask in the chat and again, uh, we can feed those through to us uh, as appropriate. Okay, so uh, without uh, further ado on that, uh, let me introduce uh, the panel. Oh no, sorry, the, evalu the evaluation first of all. Uh, um, so the first thing we're going to do is a little bit of a little bit of pre-evaluation. So you can see on here, there's uh, you can go to menti.com and use the code uh, that's on the screen, forty-eight nineteen six one seven, uh, or you can click the link that uh, Grace will hopefully just post in the uh, in the chat uh, in a second. Uh, and um, the the other alternative is if you want to point your phone at the screen and use the QR code. Uh, you can do that. Uh, and then what I will do in a second is I will switch to uh, the results as we see them. Uh, so this is uh, going to work. Right, do you now see a browser window that has a QR code on it? Great, people are nodding. People on video are nodding, excellent. Um, so we're gonna move on. So um, Grace, if you're um, able to control the what people see, uh, on their phones, um, you sh people should be able to go here uh, and start submitting answers. If there's any problems, then put something in the chat and we'll try and deal with those, but people should start, we should start seeing things tick over with a little number in the bottom right uh, in a second. Uh, oh, uh, uh, the code, that's a good point. Uh, it's 4819617. Um, Um, okay, so everyone is seeing the recording screen. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, does that mean everyone's seeing? I something? think I forgot. You have to click on it um, yourself. It's not part of the screen. It looks like it's part of a slide, but it's not. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so strain. So actually, Chris, I I can see the numbers updating, but I can I can't see those being shared onto your screen. Um, would you? You want to share want, your screen if you. Would, would you like me to share mine quickly so everyone can see? It? Yeah. I was sitting here admiring this lovely bar graph, and then I realised no one else can see it, which is very <laughs> sad. So I'll very quickly um, share this. Sorry, everyone, about that. Um, yeah. Okay. So can you see my screen? What ages do you teach? There we go. Fantastic. So yeah, I, I, I mean, I was admiring these numbers coming in. Sorry, no one else can see them. Um, I'll just now go on to our next question. Where in the world are you based? So we're aware we have people from uh, all over the world uh, taking part in this. Uh, so um, people can uh, people ask. We've got a, a word cloud there. Oh, Canada, excellent. Aberystwyth, with Cardiff, UK. Yes, please be able to be as precise or as imprecise as you want. <laughs> the world, space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who put Venus? <laughs> Excellent, that's looking good. Uh, we've got a few from Wales, an IOP Wales uh, event, so the fact we've got a few, quite a few from Wales, Pembrokeshire, Caerphilly, Aberystwyth, this is great. So we've got Canada, we've got Spain. Hola, Spain. Uh, Excellent, and Venus, of course. <laughs> I don't know how you say hello in Venus. <laughs> Venusian. Yeah, there's a YouTube video about how to speak Venusian. I will let people uh, look that up uh, in their own time. Uh, so yeah, so two little fun questions. Uh, do you think there is life elsewhere? And do you think there is life on Venus? Um, <laughs> excellent. 
controversy. Here we come. Okay, so people are generally pretty keen that there's life elsewhere. I think the 6.9 in the middle is the average of the two, so we can sort of ignore that for this, uh, for these purposes. But we're getting a, I'd say that's a pretty good, um, pretty good consensus that people think there's life elsewhere, but um, a bimodal distribution on whether there's life on Venus. Um, no one willing to hedge their bets and say definitely. That's um, probably a good thing. Um, okay. Uh, so for those of you who are teachers and even for those of you who weren't, if you were to go into a classroom, if you're not a teacher and discuss this, how confident would you feel discussing, uh, Venus and, I'm so uh, sorry for my typo. Terrible. <laughs> Spot the non-physicist. I, I can't see a typo. Yeah, your spelling of phosphine is correct. Yeah, that was it. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Did I spell it incorrectly in another slide then, maybe? <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing better than the autocorrect on my, my computer. It's always spelled it wrong. Yeah. And that's it. That looks like we okay. move on to the so final last couple. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so, and this was just an idea uh, to get a feeling. So, the. Um, ah, this is. Yeah, the, here you go, Grace. Here's your. Uh, that, that's your there you go. problem. Uh, so which which subject is Venus phosphine detection most relevant to? So you should, is Grace, is anyone that can drag the sliders? And for they can click press 10. Basically, they've got 100 points to allocate to biology, chemistry and physics, and they can allocate them in lots of 10 or just fill the numbers in. Going. Wow. Wow. OK, interesting. I was only three people voted. OK, I'll, uh, I'll stop getting to it. Well, similar is very nice. Yeah. yeah. Guys, you've got an interdisciplinary uh, field here. You've got proof by Mentimeter. Well, Great. Uh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Great. Is that the last one before we... Absolutely. That's it for now. Excellent. So I need to now share my screen. Ooh. Zoom has gone, of course. Of course, Zoom has gone. Uh, share screen, uh, find my PowerPoint presentation. Right, so we've done that bit. So, um, introducing you to uh, the panel uh, for now. Um, uh, so, the panel uh, that we've got today, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Jane Greaves from here in Cardiff, or not here in Cardiff, she's in her house, I'm in my house. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Dave Clements from Imperial College London, Dr. Paul Rimmer from uh, University of Cambridge. And Dr. Emily drabeck Maunder from Royal Observatory Greenwich uh, was formerly here in Cardiff and Imperial actually, uh, has been in various, uh, various places, but now is at, is at Royal Observatory uh, Greenwich. Uh, and then just at the bottom, there's, there's me and Grace, who you've not seen on camera, but um, uh, is, uh, is there, you can see a photo, you can see what Grace uh, would have looked like if she uh, had a video on. Uh, there, is, there is us and we'll be chairing. Uh, so, um, I think we'll move on to the, um, the panel discussion. So first up is, uh, oh, actually, before we do that, sorry, here's the, uh, that, those are the four people who we've got on the panel here. Here is a, a, a picture that was put together by the East Asian Observatory, who won the James Clark Maxwell uh, Telescope. Um, and uh, this is the full collaboration um, that uh, published all the, the author list of the paper. So there's all the people involved. So this is not, not even just the four people you can see on the screen. Uh, on the Zoom call, you can see uh, lots of other people uh, as well. Okay, so the first presentation, just for a few minutes, is uh, from uh, Professor Jane Greaves. So, um, Jane, uh, I'll uh, I'll start clicking. You can tell me next slide when you're ready, and um, we'll uh, we'll go from there. So, take it away, Jane. Thank you very much, Chris. So, and thank you everybody for coming along um, for this evening because I appreciate it. it is an evening and you're probably all tired. Um, this is actually my sixth teleconference today, so I'm sorry if I'm a bit incoherent, but I'm sure um, we'll uh, get onto some very good questions later. So the background of this project is an interest in phosphorus as an element that's vital to life. So it's an atom needed to make a DNA molecule um, and it's very common in minerals. So it would have probably have been in a mineral that arrived on the early earth that might have had something to do um, with the origins of life if it was a phosphorus bearing active mineral um, delivered by a meteorite onto the young planet, for example. 
Um, so where it comes from is thought to be, if you look at the periodic table, it's the one with the white box around it, um, element 15, phosphorus, probably mostly comes um, from supernovae, so um, the explosions of very massive stars. And because that's energetic, that event can put phosphorus out into local space in the galaxy and then eventually work its way through in some form of gas or minerals um, and go, travel through space, end up in new planets and eventually perhaps in um, organisms, biosystems on planets. So not so much is known about phosphorus in detail as a cosmic element from astronomy. So the work we've done on phosphine has at least added something to our knowledge of phosphorus in planets. So if you go on to the next slide, please, Chris. Um, I got into this um, because of this idea that um, it might be a way to look for life on Venus, because I came across this idea that phosphine, PH3, so as shown in the stick and ball there, this really simple model molecule, is actually on Earth pretty much only created by life. You can make it... Um, as a chemical deliberately, so it's used for fumigation, for example, but otherwise it's made on Earth only by small organisms li living in oxygen-free conditions, so anaerobic bacteria. And that's good for us, because if it went everywhere, we'd be poisoned, because um, phosphine, PH3, is very toxic to larger life forms. But it is produced and probably is a waste product um, by these small bacteria. And it normally stays restricted in somewhere like a swamp, and we don't have to worry about it too much, maybe monitor it a bit and make sure... Um, you know, people living nearby are not affected. But it turns out one of the major places on Earth you find phosphine is the Antarctic. So there's this beautiful study of one of the islands off the coast of the Antarctic continent. Um, I believe it's Gentoo penguins there, like this little chap. Um, and essentially they have these anaerobic bacteria in their guts. So as they you know, leave waste on the ice, you can study this and you can study penguins. And I don't know what a penguin crapologist is technically called or whether this is a career students might aspire to, but there you go. So anyway, if you had another planet with phosphine around, um, say as a gas um, from some other organisms, it would be very interesting as a biomarker. So if we could have the next slide, please, Chris. So what we did was look for Venus because this is long standing idea that the surface of Venus is not habitable today, but possibly um, the upper clouds are and this hasn't actually been very much investigated, which is why um, what we've done appears to be quite a breakthrough. Um, so to summarize, the surface of Venus today is at these horrendous temperatures and pressures, and it's an enormous runaway greenhouse effect. So the atmosphere is now nearly all the greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, CO2. But um, earlier in the history of the sun, it was a bit less luminous. Venus might have been a lot like the Earth is today. So, um, you know, oceans and continents and so on. And maybe the emergence of some kind of um, even a complex um, ecosystem. But as the runaway greenhouse took hold and it got very hot as a result on the surface and very dry, and that's a genuine picture taken by one of the Soviet landers in the um, picture at the bottom left. I mean, it really looks totally desiccated. Maybe some of these anaerobic bacteria could have floated up and lived in the clouds, whereas you can see from the diagrams, it's much more Earth-like in terms of temperature and pressure. Um, and so they would have had to become totally free of the hostile conditions at the surface. Uh, and this is pretty much all I know about it because I'm an astronomer, not a biologist. But apparently there is an aerial biosphere of the Earth, um, free floating organisms in our clouds. But they don't have to be independent of the surface because our surface of the planet isn't hostile. So they can land and get nutrients down there if they want. But anyway, there's this long standing idea that in these very high clouds, about 50 kilometers up, um, it could be possible to have a completely floating habitat for organisms small enough to float. Okay, so if we go on to the next slide. So we'll see how the results were obtained later. Um, but what we got at the bottom is these two spectra 
from two independent telescopes. So that's the yellow jagged curve and the red jagged curve. And what those are showing is the horizontal axis is wavelength and the vertical axis is intensity of light. So if there were no phosphine molecules there, you'd get a flat but slightly scruffy um, because of random scatter, a slightly scruffy horizontal line going straight across the plot. But because the molecules can absorb at a very specific wavelength, and that's actually associated with a change in their rotation, but because of quantum physics, they can only make a jump from one rotation state to another one, not all sorts of speeds in between. Okay, so um, they absorb this very specific amount of energy, which means that you lose the light of the planet at that frequency or wavelength. And so in this graph against wavelength, you see that bit of missing light. So to summarize the results, um, we can see from how deep those red and yellow curves are that the phosphine is present and about 20 molecules of phosphine parts per billion for all the other ones, which are mostly CO2. And we were able to also deduce um, that they're coming from above the cloud layer, which is opaque at the wavelength we used of about one millimeter below heights of about 55 kilometers. So the molecules are bobbing around in that upper part of the temperate zone in the diagram. Um, and therefore they're being produced maybe at a height compatible with life. And another aspect of that, which I think somebody will mention later, is to do with the circulation. You wouldn't expect, given the planetary global circulation, to see phosphine at the poles if the organisms sink down through the clouds before we reach the polar areas shown by those white bits in the diagram at the bottom. Okay. Um, and so um, my colleague has... Um, Colleagues have come up with even a life cycle of these little molecules, um, sorry, these little microbes floating around in the clouds and how they might conquer being dried out or um, removed inside raindrops and that kind of thing. So that's pretty much all I need to say. We um, have definitely have not found life, but we have found uh, some um, a chemical, a molecule that's really hard to explain by what we know about the natural chemistry occurring on Venus. So it leaves the possibility that um, it could be produced by some kind of anaerobic bacteria, microorganisms, if they work in anything like the way um, the anaerobic bacteria work on Earth. So I'm not sure if I have another slide, Chris, or if that's me done. <laughs> Great. So that's the summary introduction. And now um, I hope I didn't rush through that too much, but you're going to hear some more detail um, from the next speakers, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you very much, Jane. Um, so on to our, uh, our next uh, speaker. So uh, Dr. Dave Clements, uh, as I mentioned, is at Imperial College London um, and is also an astrophysicist. Um, and he's going to talk to us about uh, detecting phosphine and so on. So, uh, Dave, take it away. Okay, so next slide, please. So, what these are the two telescopes that we use to detect phosphine in the cloud decks of Venus. Um, the one on the left is the uh, James Clark Maxwell telescope. Can, can you see my video? Uh, I just realized that, uh, yeah, so uh, get this right. That one is the James Clark Maxwell Telescope um, <clears throat> up on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It has one 15 meter dish um, and you can't see the dish because it has this very large um, sunshade and wind protector over it. So that's actually, a big, I think the world's largest piece of um, Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex, <laughs> Gore that's the word, that's the, go that's the word, Gore-Tex. Uh, that's used to protect the dome. On the right, we have the ALMA array, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, uh, and this has 44 15 meter dishes, so much, much larger collecting area than JCMT. It's also at a higher altitude above more of the atmosphere, so is a little bit more uh, sensitive because of that as well, because there's less absorption in the atmosphere. Um, our first observations were at JCMT. Uh, and then um, a while later, we managed to get some time on ALMA to confirm our results. Next slide, please. So what are we looking for here? So as Jane alluded to uh, at the start, we're looking for transitions that, that are narrow lines uh, as a result of 
quantum mechanical changes to the behavior of phosphine. Now, the kind of things you're most familiar with by looking at uh, with, with your eyes, if you're peering through one of these um, nice spectrometers that, um, that can be made from DVDs or CDs, what you're looking at there are atomic transitions where electrons are being excited into higher energy states. We are not looking at those. Uh, what we're more looking at is the behavior of the molecules as the molecules vibrate, which produces near infrared transitions for phosphine. And at longer wavelengths where we're able to look, we're looking at its change in rotation. So it, it rotates a bit, a bit faster or a bit slower. That the excitation from, that we're dealing with. And we're looking at this in, in, in absorption, which means that light from below wherever the phosphine is, so um, the illuminating surfaces of an altitude of about 50 kilometers, uh, it's where the atmosphere becomes uh, opaque at these wavelengths. So light from that layer is passing through material above it, and some of the photons being emitted match up in wavelength to our rotational transition for phosphine. And a small fraction of those photons will interact with phosphine molecules and be absorbed by them. And that leads to um, photons at that wavelength being removed. So if you compare at the wavelength of the phosphine with wavelengths on either side, you'll see a dip in the amount of radiation coming through. Next slide, please. So that's the theory. We should not see a nice little narrow line. Unfortunately, the data is not very nice. So what you see on the left here with our colleague Jess Dempsey, the deputy director of the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, is the receiver that we use to do this. It's called receiver A. It's been on the telescope pretty much since the telescope was commissioned in the late 80s. The instrument itself is actually about 30 years old and has just been decommissioned. Um, so at some level, it was on its last legs when we did these observations. Uh, but the, the, the problems that you see with the data on the right are common to even the most up-to-date instrument trying to do these observations because Venus is too bright. It, it um, produces standing waves in the cabin. You get uh, reflections from things that usually you don't see reflections from uh, and there are some inherent issues with the way these these instruments work which give you as you can see in the top slide top top right hand corner you see complex varying baselines which have to be removed um, we do that uh, and remove those baselines and there is still stuff that's left what you see on the left here with this color plot is the individual scans that we've done uh, wavelength from or, and fre or frequency from left to right um, and time down in the vertical axis. So we, you're seeing consistent patterns which vary with time uh, and with wavelength. And the, this is nothing to do with Venus. These are all instrumental effects which have to be determined and removed. So that was an extremely annoying and uh, lengthy process which Jane and Emily led um, but we end up with a result where you can subtract off the, all these wiggles and see an absorption line beneath them. Next slide please. The same also goes at some level for ALMA. ALMA are observed in a very different way. It's an interferometer for your, your, your interfering the signals from different telescopes with each other but so they, since they're using similar receivers to receive the signal from venus you end up with similar uh, annoyances in the data um, and it's also too bright um, alma was not really designed to measure small changes in very bright objects as a function of frequency which is what we're doing here so we had to use special calibration processes uh, which pushed the capabilities of, of ALMA beyond what, what it was designed to do, but it's an excellent instrument and it was perfectly capable of doing that. Next slide, please. So what do we find? Um, you can see here a comparison of the two data sets. After all the wiggles have been removed, 
we find the ones that are there even when you do you process the data and you can see absorption um, at the same matching wavelength um, matching frequency on the JCMT on the left and ALMA on the right and since ALMA is a much uh, bigger more sensitive telescope you can see that the dip is more clearly detected with ALMA than with JCMT. Now these data were taken on different times so the velocity shift of Venus with respect to the Earth would be different on both occasions, so, but it lines up at where we would expect phosphine to be, so that um, indicates that it's coming from Venus. We've compared uh, lists, extensive lists of uh, molecules that uh, might in principle overlap with the frequency of phosphine, but we don't find any, anything that could mimic this effect. There's a little bit of contamination from SO2 perhaps, um, but that's small um, and accounts for I think up, up to about 10% of what we're seeing. So this converts to an abundance of phosphine in the atmosphere of 20 parts per billion. Uh, next slide please. I think that may be my end. Ah oh, yes, where is it? Well we can't tell with JCMT data because that just looks at the planet as a single blob, uh, but ALMA is capable of resolving uh, the disk of Venus and so we can do some make some effort to restrict or to, to work out if, if the amount of phosphine absorption varies with position and you can see that in the, the bottom left diagram here if you look at the mid latitudes sort of the um, temperate zone as it were on Venus we, that's where the phosphine absorption is greatest there's possible sign of it at the, at the equator, but it's certainly much weaker than at the mid-latitude. There's no sign of it at the pole. Now, this is interesting because the atmospheric circulation processes at uh, the kind of altitudes where we're detecting phosphine at. So at the poles, you have a polar vortex, which means that um, the upper layers and the lower layers of the atmosphere, lower layers of the atmosphere being much hotter and therefore um, would be hostile to life, hostile to, 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 to um, putative unusual chemistry. Um, the clouds are not stable yet, recycled below, and so anything in them would, would be destroyed. In the temperate zone, um, the lifetime of the clouds is much, much longer. Uh, and at the equator, it's a little bit difficult to tell. It, sort of, it depends on the details of where the, the, these convection cells are, Hadley cells, as to what's going on. So that's consistent with what we're seeing being related to processes in the clouds that take some time or that are disrupted by going to the more uh, hostile parts of Venus at lower levels. Next slide. You're done. I'm done, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so uh, next up uh, in our uh, quick roundup of the results, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Paul Rimmer, who's based at uh, University of Cambridge, um, and he's gonna talk to us about um, where the phosphine uh, could um, come from and where it could go to, you see what I mean? So I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Paul uh, take it from here. Thank you, Chris. So uh, the first thing to, talk about a little bit is um, is something that precedes what's on the slide and that's uh, why is phosphine so unexpected in fact you do see it on other planets in our solar system you see it on uh, Jupiter and you see it on Saturn and the large re reason why you do is uh, those achieve the sort of temperatures and pressures and they have a lot of available hydrogen so that the phosphorus that's there can bond with that hydrogen and form this, uh, this phosphine, this pH3. Venus really struggles with this because it just doesn't have very much hydrogen. It's very, very limited in the amount of hydrogen that it has. And so it's much easier to destroy than it is to create by any known process. Uh, what you can do is you can look at the different ways in which it can be destroyed. It can be destroyed by photodissociation, which is when an ultraviolet photon comes from above and hits the phosphine and knocks off one of the hydrogens. It's very unlikely to find that hydrogen again, so it's pretty much lost. 
Uh, it can also be destroyed thermally uh, near the surface. The temperatures are hot enough that a uh, carbon dioxide molecule will run into the phosphine, do the same sort of thing. It knocks off one of the, one of the hydrogens. In addition, it can be uh, destroyed by, um, by reacting with a uh, hydroxyl radical, this OH, or by O, or by H, or even by chlorine atoms, which are relatively abundant in Venus's atmosphere. And so combining all these, you get a sort of lifetime. How long can phosphine survive? Um, near the surface and above the clouds, its survival is very short. Um, above the clouds, it's on the order of uh, days to minutes to seconds, depending on, on the model. Um, but in the sort of middle region, around 20 to 40 kilometers, uh, it could survive, uh, the maximum sort of age would be about 500 years, um, probably a bit less than that, but on the order of hundreds of years. And so um, there needs to be a continuous source of the phosphine in order to keep it at that 20 parts per billion level over the time scales that, uh, that we see it. And uh, that will require some sort of energy. I see lightning, cosmic rays, and volcanism are listed here. Um, you can also have meteoritic delivery. Um, uh, next slide. And uh, that's a particularly uh, nice picture of uh, 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 a potential uh, meteoritic delivery. Uh, so a lot of these sorts of processes can be looked at. Um, so one of the first processes that you could think would be volcanism. Um, I'll start there, or surface processes. These are uh, limited by the thermochemistry. And the way thermochemistry works is it's very much like you just have a bunch of atoms and they're like deck, uh, uh, cards in a deck. You shuffle the cards and whatever ends up next to whatever else is the sort of molecules that you form. So you have some phosphorus atoms and you shuffle and there's a lot more oxygen atoms around and so you tend to make phosphorus bound with oxygen. There are very, very few hydrogen atoms around and so you make very, very little phosphine. And so this is the difficulty with all of the surface processes. Photochemistry could potentially help a little bit more because uh, uh, it's not driven toward equilibrium. You can drive away from equilibrium. And that's what this nice picture on the side shows. Um, the different colors are the efficiency of the different reactions. And so you, you can start with the way that, that most of the phosphorus is, which is in the form of, uh, of phosphoric acid or uh, uh, P406, depending on where you are in the atmosphere. And you can, you can follow it as it loses its oxygens and gains its hydrogens. The colors represent um, uh, green and blue are relatively fast, red is very slow, and the problem is no matter what path you take to try to get to phosphine, you have to pass through these, these, these red lines, these paths that are very, very slow. And unfortunately, you're, you're uh, thousands of times, tens of thousands of times too little uh, uh, phosphine is produced even with the most favorable assumptions uh, for these particular reaction rates. Delivery has a similar problem. If uh, uh, delivered material has this mineral called Schreibersite, and uh, Schreibersite um, uh, contains reduced phosphorus, you could say that all that reduced phosphorus could be changed into phosphine, which is unrealistic, but you could imagine that all the phosphorus that's being delivered was turned into phosphine. Um, you would still be about 10,000 times too little phosphine, uh, given the, the continuous delivery rates. Um, next slide. So one possibility, and in fact, the, the only possibility that provides um, the, the rates of for, of formation sufficient to explain this, uh, this 20 parts per billion uh, amount of phosphine that we know of um, is this biological production. And in fact, uh, uh, looking at um, uh, ecologies of anaerobic organisms on Earth, they produce um, uh, uh, 
10 times or more the amount that you would need in order to explain this amount of, uh, of, of phosphine. There are some very serious challenges, however, to imagining organisms in the clouds. The clouds are made of sulfuric acid, which is, which is one particular problem. Sulfuric acid is very, very good at, at breaking down sugars, and life is, uh, as we know it, is built largely out of, uh, out of these, these sorts of carbohydrates. It would need a very, very effective protection. But another real challenge is that um, uh, uh, sulfuric acid clouds are very hygroscopic, which means that they, they take a, a, a lot of the water and they use it up. And so the available water is very, very little. It's hundreds of times less than honey. And honey is a wonderfully sterile um, uh, 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 sort of thing. It's very, very hard to get microbes to grow in honey. It's one of the reasons why it can be safe on your shelf for so long. And uh, the, the clouds of Venus are even more challenging in this respect. And so there would be a lot of mysteries that would need to be solved in order to really explain how life could thrive in these sorts of clouds. Um, uh, but uh, as we can see in the bottom part, there is at least a sort of thermodynamic basis for explaining um, a metabolism that could lead to phosphine as a byproduct. It's a little difficult, again, to imagine why life would do this, given that hydrogen is so rare. But life does a lot of strange things on Earth as well. Hydrogen is relatively rare on Earth, and phosphine is produced, methane is produced, ammonia is produced. So uh, um, next slide. I think you're uh... Uh, you're done. Great. Thanks. So, Thank uh, you very much, Paul, for that, uh, that overview. Um, so that, that's about the, the, where the phosphine could or couldn't uh, originate. And just to finish off, we've got uh, Dr. Emily drabeck maunder who, as I mentioned, uh, was involved in this discovery from, uh, from uh, the start, essentially, uh, and is now at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. She's going to tell us about the, um, where this fits into the broader uh, search for life. So, Emily, over to you. Uh, so searching for life in our solar system, as you can probably guess, is not the easiest thing for us to do. Um, we're, we're not searching for complex and intelligent life or life that is like us in some way that can, for example, communicate through a sort of language, um, life that's developed technology that can change their environment in a way that helps their survival, or life that is as flexible and adaptable as humans are. So we're not looking for that kind of life. Um, astronomers are looking for a life that's more subtle, um, things that can be more similar to microorganisms and microbes, as was discussed before. And we're specifically looking for evidence of gases that this form of life produces. Um, now, there's a few places in our solar system other than the clouds of Venus um, that are good locations to search for life. Um, now, most people, when they think about life in the solar system, they're thinking about life potentially on the planet Mars. And the presence of methane uh, in Mars's atmosphere, it was originally found in 2004, and it's still uncertain what produces this gas. Um, but methane is a biosignature gas. It could indicate um, life in Mars's atmosphere. Now, the amount of methane has been known to vary over time. Um, but what's interesting is that methane is an unstable gas. It should break down very quickly by the sun's ultraviolet light. So something needs to continu continuously produce the methane that is seen in Mars's atmosphere. Now, like I said before, we're unsure if um, methane can be produced geologically um, or if it's produced by life. So it could be produced geologically through reactions between water and certain rocks or even through some sort of volcanic activity, um, but also methane can be produced by life. So if you look on the earth, certain microorganisms can produce methane. And normally uh, life on the earth, um, methane is produced uh, through uh, uh, respiration. Uh, it's one of the products uh, produced through respiration. If you go to the next slide. Now, also, um, other places that we could search for life in the solar system are some of the moons in our solar system. And um, some of these moons are, are incredibly fascinating. They're like little worlds in and of themselves. And they include moons like um, Jupiter's moon Europa and Saturn's moon Enceladus. And actually, these two moons have their own liquid water oceans. Um, the moons, just to describe them a little bit, they're covered in ice. 
And as the two moons orbit their planets, gravity will pull on them, uh, it will stretch them and squeeze them, and that actually causes their cores to heat up and create a liquid water ocean below their icy surfaces. Now, these two moons are ex exciting prospects for life because every form of life that we find on the Earth needs liquid water to survive. Um, and there's also evidence that these oceans may resemble Earth's oceans in some ways. So for example, at the bottom of Earth's oceans, there are what's called hydrothermal vents, um, which are openings in the seafloor that tend to be incredibly warm. And on Earth, there are many forms of life that can be found existing around these hydrothermal vents. So it's possible that Europa and Enceladus may have similar environments to what we see um, in Earth's oceans. But what's even more amazing is that we might be able to study these oceans without actually sending probes to dig below their surfaces to reach the oceans themselves. And this is because, which this is what you'll be able to see in both of these images, there are geysers on the surfaces of these moons that actually are created by the oceans, so they come from the oceans. And the gases coming from these geysers can be studied in more detail to better understand what the oceans themselves are made up of. Um, if you go to the next slide, Chris, I believe that's the summary slide. So just in summary, um, what I would say is that the team was pretty shocked when we actually found phosphine. Um, we didn't necessarily expect to find phosphine gas in Venus's clouds. This was kind of a, a sort of high risk, high reward study. Um, we thought that we might not be able to detect phosphine, but we might be able to put an upper limit on how much phosphine gas is in Venus's clouds. So even not detecting it can still be really important and can stay, still say a lot about Venus's atmosphere. But then we actually found it. So it was a big shock, I think, to most of us. Um, we still have not been able to explain the amount of phosphine gas that we see in Venus's clouds through our current understanding of the planet, uh, which means that there are still many questions to answer for how phosphine is produced in Venus's clouds. And I would say if we really want to confirm if there is life in Venus's clouds, eventually what we'll need to do in the long term is send a spacecraft out to the planet Venus to study the atmosphere directly or in situ, and that can really give us the answers that we need. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, that brings us to the end of the talks. Uh, thank you for, to all the, uh, the panellists uh, for those. Um, so the, uh, the plan now is to allow some time for questions and answers from, uh, well, questions from the audience and answers from the panel. Uh, and, um, or maybe, maybe the audience have the answers, who knows, that would be great. If someone can give us the answer, that, that would be remarkable. Um, then uh, the way this is gonna work is if you could put your hand up, uh, I, will, um, I will stop screen sharing so I can see a little bit more about what's, uh, what's going on. So as Grace has put in the chat, um, uh, then if you'd like to ask, ask a question, then you can type it in the chat and uh, we can uh, read it out. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question yourself, then you can raise your hand and we'll invite you to turn on your microphone uh, to do so. So let me stop screen sharing now. Uh, you don't need the pictures of everyone because you can see them uh, on your screen. Um, so just while people uh, get, their, um, get their, their thoughts in order in what questions they want to ask, I'll ask one that we were sent in uh, online um, uh, before the before the, the talk, um, I'm not sure who wants to take this, but um, is there a, if there's a, a space mission to to Venus, um, what tests would be done to look for for life, uh, and and would you do that? Emily mentioned sample uh, doing doing tests in Venus, but would you do a sample return kind of thing? So I guess uh, is Paul the best person to take a what what test do you do for life? Is that is that your area as a as a biochemist? Sorry. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I'm a photochemist and not a biochemist. Uh, <laughs> there, there are a couple biochemists on the team, but unfortunately they're not here tonight. Um, and I would definitely recommend reading uh, Sarah Seeger's paper about the sort of life cycle that you might expect on Venus. It uh, has some beautiful illustrations and is quite accessible. Um, and actually also, I'm not much of an instrumentalist. I think uh, 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 Dave or, 
or Jane or Emily would have something more to say about the sort of uh, missions and capabilities for actually getting sort of in situ measurements um, within the atmosphere of Venus. So I'm going to punt that question. So it maybe divides into, um, we could do more with telescopes on the ground. That's very challenged at the moment because they need staff and a lot of telescopes are in remote places and traveling there is a, a risk for COVID. So um, that's a little hampered at the moment. Um, but in the medium term future, um, a space agency could send an orbiter or a descent probe, um, essentially. So an orbiter um, would um, take images of the planets, um, the structure of the atmosphere from above. Um, the really exciting one is probably another descent probe. We haven't had one, I think, since 1985. So that could either measure directly the chemistry of the atmosphere, um, so a mass spectrometer um, could sample the masses of chemical compounds it collects in whatever form. So phosphine is a phosphorus atom with a mass of 31 and three hydrogens with a mass of one. So if it sees something on a mass of 34 and maybe some isotopes of that, it can confirm um, the phosphine. And then there are some more um, advanced things um, you could lower. You could potentially even um, take samples of the gas um, and the liquids, um, see if it reacts in a biological sort of way. Um, there have even been some ideas to kind of lower a microscope into the clouds and see if there's something squiggling about in a sample. So I think that's kind of the range of options. Um, I'm not an expert on the tech, but um, you know, some of the kids in school um, will grow up in that era, I hope. One thing I'd like to add to that is, is the question about a sample return mission, which would be the absolute gold standard where you can fly some of this back and really understand what's going on. The problem with that is that Venus is actually a fairly big planet, uh, about the same mass as Earth. And so to get something to escape the gravitational pull of Venus is a lot harder than getting something to escape the gravitational pull of the moon or Mars. Um, <clears throat> so that means you've essentially got to build a, a full scale launch vehicle that can get off the well, near surface of Venus, um, put that onto a rocket that will get off the surface of the Earth, fly it to Venus, get it down into the Venus atmosphere, get your sample and then launch it off again. Um, that's a really tough job particularly because you, you have to launch it from presumably a floating balloon rather than from... Yeah, ab absolutely. So uh, back of the envelope calculation suggests that you will need two tons just of fuel that will go on your rocket, which is going to weigh a fair amount of stuff, which will have your balloon, which will be floating, carried by the balloon, which will carry your sample grabber which goes into your sample return on the rocket to fly back. Um, just launching two tons to Venus is not easy. Getting it to come back, yeah, yeah so it's going to take a lot of work. The, the Mars Curiosity rover, I think, the, is the largest rover on Mars and it's one ton, right? Yeah. So the, the heaviest thing we've sent to Mars to land on the surface is one ton. So, so it, it is. probably doesn't float very well either, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not got wings. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, another question that's been raised is that, I mean, there are missions that are planned to go to Venus, either being planned or, or proposed or at, at various stages. So we've got um, uh, Envision, we've got Da Vinci, they're all at various stages uh, and so on. Uh, and I think Veritas is, is another one. Um, they, are they going to be able to answer these questions at all in, you know, five years, ten years, at whatever point they get to Venus? Are they going to be equipped? The, the Da Vinci probe is the most interesting one because that is a balloon that's meant to bounce around in the bits of the atmosphere that we are interested in. Um, several of the others are, including Envision, which is the European proposal, uh, are not directed at this kind of science at all. Their main goals are to look at the surface with um, a radar system, similar to the ones that are used for mapping the surface of the Earth. And their main goals are actually to understand uh, the volcanism, uh, the, what, what volcanic or tectonic activity is going on on Venus at the moment and, and why the volcanic behaviour of Venus is different to the, the volcanic behaviour of the Earth. A long way away from the bits of the atmosphere that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. uh, 
there may be a little bit of a handbrake turn on some of these missions, uh, but it takes so long to get the mission planned, designed, uh, approved, funded, built, tested, uh, launched, um, that even if there was a rubber stamp on a mission now, it would be at least 10 years before anything got there. So but some um, of the newer space agencies and players um, are hoping not to have to work like a yeah. tortoise. Um, so um, Rocket Labs, the private company, um, has announced they would like to get one of their electron rockets, which I think have only gone to low Earth orbit so far. Mm. They'd like to get one to Venus in 2023. So that might be exciting um, for people in school to think that's relatively close by the time they're in sixth form or something or at university. Um, and they might be able to. Um, lower a tiny payload to get some world design measurements. Mm. The Indian Space Agency has announced plans for a relatively quick mission to, as well, um, but the details of that one are not particularly clear. They were inviting guest instruments, um, but it's um, the mission scope is not really decided. Um, and NASA's yeah. Da Vinci's mission, it will, it does seem like there are plans in place to have a mass spectrometer on board, mm. so they would be able to search for phosphine for example and confirm that directly but i mean if you know missions other missions are being planned that could potentially have some sort of astrobiological element or experiment to them then obviously that is you know preferable than you know just sending a mass spectrometer for example but um yeah, yeah so there are some plans in place there are actually a couple of opportunities that are coming up closer in time to anything that might be specifically built and these are spacecraft that are just flying past Venus anyway. Uh, one of these uh, is Bepi Colombo, which is the European Space Agency mission to, to Mercury. And that is flying past Venus. I think it might even be today. It's <laughs> going to do two fly past of Venus before it gets to Mercury. It's next um, week. It's next week. Sorry, next I've got Thursday. the calendar wrong. Yeah. So um, it, of course, is not designed to do observation aimed at phosphine or, or, no, or aimed at any atmospheric species. measures to, to mercury after all yeah quite there's no atmosphere on mercury so why bother but it turns out that it does have um, a mid-infrared spectrometer which is going to be used for mineralogy on mercury which might just be able to say something about uh, phosphine touch and go as to whether that's feasible or not if they're going to have a shot um, my uh, understanding and, and then Sorry, I was just going to mention JUICE, which is the European Space Agency mission to um, the icy moons of Jupiter, so Europa and Ganymede uh, especially. That is going to be launched uh, in a year or so's time and will fly past Venus. And it actually has a submillimeter spectrometer, um, not too dissimilar from the kind of things we use at JCMT, but working at higher frequencies where it can look at a second transition of phosphine. So the, there's a prospect there for it to confirm phosphine and hopefully be able to map out the, the, the location of phosphine in much better detail than we have at the moment. This is all very early days for these possibilities uh, because we only published the paper less than a month ago. <laughs> I know there's a big effort on, on at the moment to say to people if they've got any other ideas, then please, please, tell the team um, absolutely yes um so i think um one one question that does come up about this a little bit is if you make the assumption that this is is life and that is a massive if but if you assume that this is life um could it have originated uh, here on earth or or could it have gone you know could life have transferred from from earth to venus because we know material moves around the solar system so how how likely is that kind of thing uh, to happen who wants to to take uh, that it might be an emily okay. i think okay. <laughs> oh oh yeah oh well go for, go for. <laughs> i was gonna say i'm i'm happy to yield to paul and then do a follow-up oh. but yeah yeah um uh so um there have been some investigations about how much material has actually exchanged places between uh uh between venus and earth and it turns out that it's roughly even and so a fair amount of material has gone both ways. And so it's possible that uh, life would have started on a nice temperate Venus and uh, hitched a ride to Earth, 
or the other way around. It is also possible that uh, both of them had independent origins. Um, there are some challenges with uh, keeping things alive as they're traveling between these particular planets um, uh, that would need to be sorted out, but it is at least feasible that we do share a common origin uh, or that we have different origins. Answering that would require that incredibly ambitious sample return mission to actually get the material back and if it is based on the sort of biochemistry that we know about to actually sequence it. And, and, and Emily, oh, Paul. Uh, Emily, that idea of, um, uh, of it being a second uh, origin of life, so an independent origin of life, yeah. that's really interesting. I mean, that, that's what gets people really excited about this prospect, right? Yeah, I think so. So if, you know, life formed on the Earth independently from life that potentially formed on Venus, so two independent forms of life happening in our own solar system, then what that might really mean is that life is a lot more common than what we originally thought. And so you think about, we, we've already found over 4,000 exoplanets in our own galaxy. So these are planets orbiting other stars in our galaxy. They're outside of our solar system. Then, you know, it's possible, it's, it's a lot more likely that there might be life on those exoplanets. And there's going to be even more planets than what we've currently found. There are 300 billion stars in the galaxy. And there might be at least one exoplanet in orbit around every single one of those stars. So there could be on order of 300 billion exoplanets in the galaxy. So yeah, two independent uh, occurrences of life happening in our own solar system might mean that life is a lot more common out there in our galaxy and in other galaxies. So it's a really exciting thought. We're, uh, um, well, as, as uh, is being said in the chat, then uh, yes, that would really uh, swing, the, um, uh, swing the Drake equation uh, an awful lot. Um, so the, we're kind of running out of time. It's eight o'clock already. So we should, we should think about uh, uh, moving towards the end. So the things we'll do uh, at the end. So um, I think the first thing to do is uh, a little bit of post-evaluation of people in mind. So Grace, would you be able to share screen and throw up the, um, the Mentimeter? If you've still got your Mentimeter uh, tab or device or whatever open, you can go back, uh, go back to that and, uh, and have a look at it. Um, so, uh, we can do that, and if I remember what the, the code is, so you can, um, I assume people have probably got it up uh, for now, but you can see the code at the top of the screen, so you can go to menti.com and 4819617. So if we go to the- Can you see that okay there, Chris? Sorry, say again? Can you see that okay on my screen? Yeah, 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 I can see right. that. So if we go to the next slide, or next page. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, people have already been, uh, answering so do you think there's life uh life elsewhere um so people can sorry uh, answer that so we've still got a fairly com fairly uh fairly confident idea of there being life elsewhere but um life on venus has become less bimodal I, yeah, I think that's know. very interesting, Chris, because um, thinking there's definitely life um, elsewhere, I think perhaps um, we've introduced some of the challenges and some people are perhaps more cautious. And I think that's nice to see from a scientific point of view. And then, you know, a great range of opinions about life on Venus, including some in our you think there might be, um, which there weren't before. So that's also great because I think that's scientific opinion as um, whether people think um, there are other possibilities for the chemistry. So that's really helpful to us. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, people are always asking what the presenters uh, think of this. It's a bit hard to put a number on it, I know, but uh, <laughs> um, it, it, it's a bit mean to ask presenters what they think or ask researchers on a paper what they think they put the, the, the numbers out, unless any of you particularly want to stick a number on it and stick your neck out. But um, I suspect there's lots going to be lots of shakes of the head there. Um, so sorry, uh, people who want uh, a, a definitive uh, hedging of bets from uh, from the research team. Um, okay, so we got a good number of answers there. Great. So we move on to the last, uh, the next uh, question. Um, so, uh, given everything you've heard, how confident would you feel about discussing the Venus phosphine detection in the classroom? Oh, some very high. Excellent.
So while we're doing this, Grace put in the, the post up above, uh, sorry, in the chat up above a link to the IOP uh, Institute of Physics uh, survey, um, the uh, uh, evaluation survey. Um, so uh, if, you, if you're able to fill that in, that would be great. So Gary's just posted it again. Oh, and Grace, excellent. Uh, too much the... <laughs> two attempts there so um yeah if you're able to click that link as well um so i think we're nearly there in terms of answers to this uh this question here so people are generally confident about discussing this in the classroom that's wonderful to uh, uh wonderful to hear or to see um okay so then uh lastly uh the question we asked at the start so how relevant do you think or which subjects is venus most relevant to again you get to split your hundred uh points between the different subjects and we'll see how we go uh there Okay. Now, I think I, I just I, I will say I think this is a really good example, though, of how pretty much every branch of science is needed for astronomy, mm -hmm. because you have astrochemists, you need people to understand the chemistry of what's going on in space, you have astrobiologists, people who can study life in space as well, you need physicists as well, because we need to know how things move around. We need people who are into computer science and computer programming because we need people to run models and, and program those models. We need mathematicians as well, um, you know, to work out equations. So, I mean, I think this is a really good demonstration that this, this study, you know, we needed so many different branches of science to come together to really do it. And I think that's something that um, I always find that that students are interested in is that you need all of these, anything you're interested in in science that's needed in astronomy to really push our, our understanding of the universe as well. And penguins. You need to be a penguinologist. <laughs> we haven't needed this before, but now we do. Yeah. No, um, the only thing that I would add to that is especially important is future laboratory work because so little is known about phosphine chemistry, so little is known about anoxic chemistry and sulfuric acid solutions. And I know a lot of people think maybe all this has been worked out by other scientists before, so little's been worked out. There's so much potential for young people to explore something completely new that no one knows how it works yet. Uh, yes, uh, it's certainly a fascinating field, and it's wonderful, as everyone has said, to see so much interdisciplinary work uh, to show that this works. Uh, I was certainly struck when, when first hearing about it, and uh, even broadly, the, ra uh, the radio astronomy uh, experts to talk about the, the detections, analyzing them, combined with all the, the chemistry, the biochemistry, the photochemistry, the all sorts of chemistry, astrochemistry, uh, to, to, even, to be able to do this. N neither of those teams, I think it's fair to say, could have done this alone the the radio astronomers wouldn't have had a clue how to interpret the phosphine detection and the astrochemists i think probably wouldn't have been able to go and make the phosphine detection and analyze all the data from the radio yeah. telescopes without the, all that um experience um, i've just seen two things uh, that um uh, that grace has put in the chat as well so um what we've done the last uh, week or so is put together some uh, albeit draft educational resources um, they are they are developing uh, all the time, but there's some some five things to look at uh, there. So please go and have a look at those. Uh, and if you want to use them, if you test them, let us know what you think. The stuff about orbits, the stuff about detections, the stuff about stuff about a little bit about spectroscopy uh, and so on. So go and have a look at that. You can do some long, uh, more uh, long-winded stuff with your students, getting them to review papers. Uh, and so on as well. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, the, the link there to the teacher's mailing list is for our, our Cardiff uh, University teacher's mailing list. Other schools' teacher's mailing lists are available, uh, I'm aware. Um, but uh, if you want to sign up there, then we'll keep you posted with anything uh, that goes on. So um, thank Can you I very much. Can I just say one more extra thing, Chris? Um, <laughs> I saw a lot of people are teaching sixth form. I want to point out that we have some new Venus data from JCMT and I'm going to be working on it with undergraduate students. Um, it's going to be their mini research project. That's actually for their master's degree. So they're four years um, older than A-level students. But if you want to encourage your students into careers in science, it's not something that's way off done by elderly professors mm. 30 years older than them. It's something they can really get involved with pretty soon um, if they're interested in doing science degrees. Thanks, Chris. No, no, it's, it's a very good point. Thank you very much. Um, any final words from anyone on the panel before we uh, before we finish? Well, thank you for organising this, Chris. Um, I hope uh, everybody has had as much fun as we have.
Excellent. Um, I, I will say one thing, actually. So Jane mentioned, um, you know, getting six formers involved um, in, in doing research and things. That's actually how I started out in research. I started working with universities when I was in high school and making my own experience, experiments and doing my own research. And so when I went into university, I knew the reason why I wanted to study science is because I wanted to ask questions and I was curious. So I think, you know, students can get involved now and there's, you know, many different things that, that they can do, you know, even when they're in the sixth form, for example. So I would really encourage um, students to, to do that and get involved in those things. So we've got a lot of comments going in the chat of how much people have enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And of ideas of people uh, getting, getting involved. Um, so as uh, Carrie Ann spoke there, the Institute of Physics Evaluation Form is also there. So this is part of the IOP's Brecon Conference or the South Wales uh, Physics Teachers Conference. It's held in Brecon most years, clearly a bit more distributed this year. Um, so uh, please go and uh, fill that in if you're able. Um, I will uh, end by saying uh, thank you very much uh, to the panel and to everyone who uh, sent questions in in advance. I hope that's been interesting. Um, stay safe, everyone, and uh, we'll see you on Venus in a few years. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Thank Thanks. you.